So tonight is week three of our six-week introduction class. And you probably remember I encouraged you to notice just uh, all the different ways the thinking mind, the habit-based mind had preferred not to come to the one more Zoom meeting tonight. And just that's such a useful place where there's a little mental resistance. It's really a, a wonderful practice place to notice that that mental resistance, like, oh, I don't think so, that that is just an experience being known. Because if we don't notice mental resistance, like the resistance to coming to this class tonight, if we don't notice it, what's going to happen? So in terms of the way habit habits work or mental tendencies work, if we're not consciously aware, mindfully aware of a tendency, we're going to be swept along. It's going to, in a sense, govern what we do, what we don't do. But when we're aware of a tendency, when we're aware of biases and understand, yeah, that's the impulse in my heart. This is the inclination in the mind. Then there's some real possibilities, like to be willing to feel the desire to not get on another Zoom call, to notice the resistance as an unpleasant feeling being known. And then having made peace with the different emotions, feelings that are emotion, we can do what appears to us to be the most skillful thing because we're not afraid to feel what it feels like <clears throat> to go against the resistance. So you succeeded <laughs> if there were, if you had any resistance. Before we do the meditation tonight, the guided meditation, I just wanted to remind us of a couple things that I believe I brought up last week. <clears throat> One is this important distinction in terms of uh, the different meditation techniques that I've been covering, you've been practicing, right? So there's a, a general category of meditation training where we're consciously directing the attention. So you could call that directed meditation practice or object-oriented meditation practice where part of the mental training, <clears throat> excuse me, is to keep returning attention to a particular experience. Now, the common thing for us, a lot of us, right, we're using either the body generally, the experience of embodiment, that movement of sensation, even when we're sitting perfectly still, there's a flow a movement of physical sensation that can be known. So we could be directing the attention there or in a more specific way, still being aware of the body, but in a more specific way, the breath, like feeling the touching of the air at the nostrils or feeling the rising and falling of the abdominal wall as we breathe in, as we breathe out. So then we're directing the attention back. On week four, Oh, I'm sorry, I think it's week five. I'll introduce the loving kindness practice. That's another directed meditation. Wherever the mind wanders, as soon as we notice that the mind has gone to other aspects of experience, we direct the attention back to the chosen meditation object. So tonight again, for the first two thirds at least, we'll be doing mostly a directed meditation practice where we're, keep, we're bringing the attention back. In the biggest sense, meditation practice in this style is always directed because even when we don't have a specific object, we're directing it to the present moment. But in what we call a non-directed meditation practice or an open awareness practice, I don't like this so much, but some people call it a choiceless awareness meditation practice. Then the particular object 
that the mind is knowing, like what we're paying attention to, any object will do. Because if we're relating to those various experiences that are being known as something being known in the present moment, then any particular experience can support the continuity of present moment awareness. We're not, direct, we're not dependent on directing the attention back to a meditation object like the breath or the whole body or a mantra or a visualization or a prayer. You know, there's any number of directed meditation objects that are taught, you know, in the Buddhist tradition or in just more generally in different spiritual traditions. <clears throat> but open awareness practice, uh, a non-directed meditation practice, you can see really lends itself to practicing all day long. So what I've been recommending now is when you sit down at home, you've got your 10 minutes, you've got your 30 minutes, you've got your 45 minutes if you're lucky, right? Where you've shut your cell phone off, you've gotten the cat or dog in the other room, you've let the people you live with know to leave you alone for that amount of time, you've set your little meditation timer, you get a nice peaceful bell at the end of your time so you don't have to look at the clock, you know I've already determined I have this much time, I don't have to check, even if I feel like bolting, I'm going to stick with it until that bell rings, the alarm goes off, whatever. And then generally it's good initially to work with a directed meditation because it takes some skill to do an open attention, a non-directed practice. It can seem like we may have the intention to be present with the different things that the mind is knowing. Oh, this is being known, this is being known. But it isn't long before we're just lost in thought or caught up in some obsessive pattern. But we might think we're being mindful. But when you have a chosen, a specific meditation object, then you know you're not meditating because you're not paying attention to that object, right? So one of the advantages of using, especially at the beginning of a sit, a more directed meditation object, having a more direct, you know, specific meditation object, is it, it builds some integrity. So basically we're correlating being present with knowing this particular aspect of my experience, that feeling of sensation as the abdomen rises with the in-breath, as it falls or comes in with the out-breath, or the touching at the nostrils, or more generally the sensations of the body sitting. So it's a very particular muscle of, emphasizing that particular muscle of non-distraction when you use a specific meditation object. So really play with that tonight, you know, because I'll give fewer instructions for that first part. Really play with that continuity with the chosen object. Now the mind, the knowing mind is very quick. So you know that knowing mind might notice this, but just keep tracking knowing that you know the inhalation, knowing that you know the exhalation. Or some of you may be using hearing as your primary object when you're doing the directed meditation practice. And one of the profound things, it seems silly, you know, like just to keep one thing in mind. Whatever it is, you know, you could like have your eyes open and just have that soft gaze looking out toward the backyard, if you're looking out a window, let's say. And it's just that the mind is sort of restless and it gets bored after three seconds looking out the window. And then it wants to think this or it wants to check this out or what's going on in my knee. And because the mind is, a, <clears throat> in a way, it's one of its deep addictions is to diversity of experience flitting about, right? So when you pick up a training, that's all it is, is a particular training 
of saying to the mind, honey, right now, this is your primary object. And when you roll off and start to pay attention to something else, as soon as I notice, in a gentle but very persistent way, the attention's coming back to this object. And then it goes over here. Oh, honey, no, we're being aware of this. And then it goes over there. I don't know if I've mentioned the image, but one image that Jack Hornfield uses is, and I've never had a dog, but when you have a puppy and you're teaching it to pee on the newspaper, you know, when it's like inside, instead of going all over the carpet, you bring it back, it wanders away, you bring it back, it wanders, you keep bringing it back until it gets, oh yeah, this is where the attention is supposed to be. This is good enough. Because we're, we want to learn that experience where the mind's habit of needing this diversity, needing to connect with the diversity of experiences, we're learning, no, no, I can put down my need to think this thought, to look over here, to wonder about that sound, to feel my foot, to think this. It's sort of like, we may not like it, but we could survive for a long time on oatmeal. Nothing but oatmeal, right? But it would mean giving up like all of my likes of all these different flavors and different textures and different this and different that. So <clears throat> there's a real lesson to be learned about the heart of just being with one thing because there is real freedom and not having to attend to all those other things we don't realize you know it's like when i'm addicted you now every day you know i need my matcha latte and i need this and i need that and i need to check the news and i need to check my email and I need to check in with this friend. And we feel like it actually begin, begins to be internalized. If I can't do this, if I can't have that, then I'm incomplete. My life's not okay. And then when we, um, for whatever reason, might have to let all that go, it may be initially very painful because we're addicted to the idea that I need these things in, in, to be happy. But then we go on a backpacking trip and we can't do any of that. And we realize it's so nice to be free of the dependence. It's not that those things are necessarily bad, but the mind or the heart that's dependent on having that, and then that, and then that, that's stressful. So to realize, like in a 30-minute sit, to realize that my mind can retreat from its idea that it needs to think about this and worry about that and fantasize and listen and do and to put all of that diversity of experiencing down and to realize I can be aware of the in-breath, I can be aware of the out-breath, I can be aware of the in-breath. You see, it's a little bit like death because all of those impulses in my heart to think this, to worry about that, to plan this, right? I'm learning to let them all die. The person that wants to think that, wants to fantasize, wants to plan, wants to obsess, wants to, wants to, wants to, all of that begins to die because we're cultivating this value and being aware of just one thing. So in Buddhism, we call that seclusion. The mind is secluding itself from the diversity of experiencing whatever else in terms of its mental and bodily activities it would be engaged in, involved in, right? It's withdrawing from our usual diversity of experiencing. And instead, it's knowing one thing, feeling the breath coming in, feeling the breath going out. Now that's a lot, that there's a lot there just in knowing the breath coming in and going up. But it's a huge step towards simplicity. 
Now, it's not about doing this forever. It's about no knowing, one, the mind can drop its idea that it's dependent. Like when I have the impulse to obsess about something, I have to do it right now. No, you don't. That's just that tug to think that, to worry about that, to plan that. And we can be aware of that impulse without acting it out and return back to the chosen object, the meditation object. And then they feel another tug. And if we're really on our game, right, if there's some good continuity, we'll notice the tug, but we don't have to act it out. A lot of times we don't notice the tug and we're already fantasizing or planning or thinking. Or, and we might have been lost in thought for three or four minutes before mindfulness realizes, oh yeah, I'm thinking. Thinking's like this. But then, even though it's not so easy, we take a moment, we notice what it feels like to be lost in thought. What's the underlying charge here? And then we come back to our chosen object. So really think about this initial part of practice where we're working with a meditation object as a developing a particular muscle in the mind. Initially, it's the muscle of non-distraction, keeping one thing in mind. Then it's, <clears throat> it develops into learning the very particular pleasure of the mind secluding itself from what it thinks of as its need to think this, to do this, to fantasize, right? So it's really the pleasure of non-dependence, or as I mentioned, we call it the happiness of seclusion. It's a particular kind of happiness, the mind not being dependent on worldly experience. And of course, we're gonna go back to thinking this and being aware of that, but to know that we can put it down. It's a little bit like, I might have mentioned this one of the earlier weeks, like deep sleep. Because to really go into deep sleep, the mind, the heart, is letting go of its addictive relationship to experience. That's the very definition of deep sleep, right? For that period of time, maybe a couple times during the night, I forget how long it lasts, but it's, it's not the majority of our sleep at night. You know, mostly it's dream sleep. But there are some moments of deep sleep where the mind is not entangled with sense experience. It drops it. And of course, we don't know much about that experience, do we? Because the mind isn't entangled with experience. The mind has really withdrawn from the world. And your partner, if you have a partner, they could do weird things to you in those moments of deep sleep, right? Because you're not aware of sound, you're not aware of touch. The mind has withdrawn from its sensitivity of the eye, the ear, smell, taste, and touch. It's not monitoring those sense gates, right? It's withdrawn. And we always feel good coming out of deep sleep. Interesting, isn't it? So this is part of practice, meditation practice. It's not the whole game, but it's an important mental or spiritual muscle that we definitely want to develop. And it really sets up the insight, the deepening of understanding that is really liberating. But we need this first muscle. We need to put down the world before we can really investigate the nature of the mind in the world. As long as the mind is entangled with its experience, we can't really study it. So this is why in Buddhist practice, there's a real emphasis on concentration or tranquility or this seclusion that I've been talking about. Then the second half of the practice, or maybe the last third tonight, we'll do the more open awareness practice. So instead of as for that last third, instead of directing the attention back to the chosen meditation object, some of you will use the tip of your nose, feeling the breath going in and out. Others will use the belly rising and falling. Some of you will use hearing as your primary object, right? It's up to everyone to find what their mind likes well enough. It doesn't have to be a perfect, there isn't a perfect meditation object but just choose one as your primary 
anchor, a primary meditation object. So you learn over time, to, your mind will learn to like it because it's going to associate being with the mental, with the meditation object, with the happiness of seclusion, of putting down the world and its entanglements with sense experience. And it's a very real pleasure, more satisfying than ice cream, <laughs> more satisfying than a good movie or anything you consider sort of a more ordinary worldly pleasure. But it takes some training to really access that mental bliss of seclusion. But I'm telling you, it's a real thing, right? And, you know, when you look at human culture, whether it's dancing or drumming or praying or singing, every single human culture has ways to gather the energies of the mind to one thing and put down everything else. There isn't a human culture that didn't have some ritual, some activity that allowed them to drop worldly obsessing about this and that. You know, so when you're in that, like if you were in a drumming circle, wherever, you know, w when the group is in sync and really there, you're not worried about your toothache or what you're going to say to your partner or those kids who don't listen to you because you're, the mind is absorbed in that particular meditative activity and to be absorbed, it had to drop everything else. So the mind is temporarily liberated from all of its worldly concerns. We try to do that with movies and other sorts of entertainments, right? They're just, what meditation is, this part of meditation is a real science, an art and science of how to seclude the mind from its worldly entanglements. So that we can really access the joy or the mental bliss of the heart or the mind that is not entangled, not getting pushed around by its likes and dislikes. So then when we return to more ordinary consciousness where we are aware and are entangled, that there's a reverberation from having tasted the peace of non-entanglement. And it changes then how we relate once we're back dealing with this and dealing with that. And then the last part, we're working more, not so much on concentration, which is the first part, or non-distraction, and really working more with the wisdom of non-attachment. So the first thing is really about being uh, training in intimacy by using one object or non-distraction and keeping one thing in mind. And the next thing is really working with non-attachment. So we want the exposure of different objects of experience coming and going. We're still, you know, sitting still as best we can in our meditation space at home. You know, the cell phone is still off. So the experience is still relatively simplified. But now you might even, you're, you know, more than welcome to practice, do this part of the practice with your eyes open, but it's okay to have them closed. But here, anything goes. So you're not directing the attention back to your breath or to your chosen meditation object. So when you notice that the mind is thinking, then thinking is being known. When you notice the mind is worrying, worrying is being known. When you notice that the mind is seeing, seeing is being known. When you notice that the mind is hearing, hearing is being known. When you notice you really like the sound you're hearing, liking is being known. Now, you don't have to say those words in your mind, but you can from time to time when saying something like, oh, liking is being known. When that phrase, silently, of course, in your mind, when you say that phrase, if it helps to stabilize the present moment awareness, then use that phrase. And if you don't know what it is, just say, oh, this experience is being known. That's a simple truth that can really ground the heart, the mind in the present moment. And if you, you could even ask the question, what's the mind knowing when you're doing this open awareness practice? What's the mind knowing now? 
Is there liking going on, wanting something to happen? Oh, this is greed being known. Is there not wanting, not liking happening? Oh, this is aversion being known. Is there doubt? Doubt is being known. I'll go through the obstacles a little bit more in week four where we dig into the five hindrances, but it's a list worth noticing. You probably already have learned a lot because these are the typical ways the mind gets distracted. Wanting, wanting something to happen, but not noticing that there's wanting. Oh, this is just wanting. Not wanting, that's the second hindrance. Too much energy, restlessness, worrying, you know, that kind of flitting about. Too little energy, sleepiness, dullness, and doubting. And, you know, you could probably organize the things that hinder the stability of present moment awareness in other ways, but you might as well use the way the Buddha did. It's a pretty complete list. And you can probably, anything that hinders the stability of present moment awareness, you can probably fit it to one of these or some combination of these five hindrances. Wanting, not wanting, too much energy, too little energy, and doubt. So like if you're having a real hard time, especially with this open awareness practice we do toward the end of our set, then just ask, well, are any of the hindrances happening? Is there wanting going on? Is there not wanting? Is the mind dull? Is the mind restless? Is there doubt, confusion going on? And that can really clarify because once you identify the hindrance, then you're mindful again. So mindfulness doesn't depend on there not being greed. Mindfulness depends when there's greed that wisdom recognizes, oh yeah, there's greed in the mind right now. That's what's happening. I want this sit to be done. Or I don't want this sit to continue, aversion. Or I have doubt whether I know what I'm doing in this sit. Oh, that's doubt. That's just doubt. And that's so cool to realize that the, these ordinary habits of the mind don't have to be seen as a problem. They're just the next thing being known. And that's the real power of this open awareness part of the practice is non-attachment is realizing that freedom doesn't depend on a particular circumstance or situation. Freedom depends on the heart or the mind relating to this moment with non-attachment, non-identification, non-grasping. It's, not, it's uh, you know, the simple definition of freedom is realizing the heart that's free from grasping. So realizing the mind, where the mind is aware, is intimate, but not grasping, not struggling, not in conflict with experience. And that's what we're practicing this last third of the sit tonight. So any questions about those two aspects of our sit before we move our body, stretch a bit, and then we'll sit? Any questions about what I said, these two, the directed and then the non-directed? Well, good. Uh, wait, let's see, there's a chat. So go ahead and uh, stretch yourself, adjust yourselves tonight, and we'll get started in maybe two minutes or so, or a minute. Really appreciate taking the seat, the meditation seat. And we're cultivating both a sense of relaxation 
and a sense of being upright and stable in our posture. And although we probably won't be perfectly still, it does help to, once you've settled, made any last adjustments, it, it does really help to resolve for this 30 minute period or so to hold the body relative, excuse me, relatively still. Just as best you can, of course. And if you do need to make a little or subtle adjustment to your body, then simply be aware of what's happening. You don't need to rush if you do need to make an adjustment. Better to do it with some mindful awareness. And remember the nice ritual at the beginning of sits where you take a couple longer, deeper breaths in and out and really practice not rushing as if you have all the time in the world to fill and then empty the lungs and do that maybe three to five breaths. We're using the deep breathing to relearn how to be intimate, that it's okay to be intimate with the body, to feel the sitting body now. So maybe one more of these long, easy breaths in and out. Take your time. And eventually letting the breath continue on its own, being grateful that the body knows how to breathe so we don't need to consciously manage the breathing process. Feeling the totality of the sitting body, breathing in sensitive to the whole body, while breathing out sensitive to the whole body. And of course, if you're using a different meditation object, then just make that adjustment so that you're cultivating this non-distractedness with your meditation object in a relaxed way. Don't forget the stability of present moment awareness requires that the mind and body is relaxed. But for many of us, we'll use the whole body so we feel the sensations of breathing in and we use that as a cue to be intimate with the whole body sitting. And then as we feel the beginning of the out breath, again, it's just a reminder to open, be sensitive to the whole body sitting. So one half breath at a time, we're practicing this non-distraction, this intimacy with the totality of the bodily sensations. From the beginning of each in breath to the end, from the beginning of each out breath until the end. And we do this without being tight in any way. Keeping the whole body in mind.
And there's no need to get frustrated when the mind wanders. Just acknowledge that the mind is thinking or whatever. If there's a charge, emotional charge, then acknowledge that underlying feeling feels like this. And then in a persistent but gentle way, begin again with your chosen meditation object, connecting, sustaining, and cultivating a beautiful interest. And begin to notice the inner joy of seclusion or non-distractedness. It feels good, a kind of mental healing or healing of the heart, this non-distraction.
And we can always begin again and again. This is how we develop this mental training. This gentle but per persistent willingness to begin again. And we're just knowing this simple experience of breathing in, breathing out, or feeling the sensations of the whole body as we breathe in, aware of the experience of the whole body as we breathe out, or whatever your meditation anchor is. Simply connecting, knowing it's like this now and sustaining that. So it's really a simple practice of non-distraction, keeping the meditation object in mind. And keeping the heart and mind relaxed as you do that. And be interested in the continuity with your meditation object. Simply tracking in a continuous way and then eventually the mind wanders and beginning again. Can we sustain this awareness with the meditation object? And begin to feel the happiness of seclusion on distraction. So a few more minutes.
And we'll slowly transition when you feel ready to this more open awareness practice. And for some folks, it helps to allow the eyes to open, although we're not looking around and you don't need to open your eyes. So whatever you like. And so of course, there will be more objects of experience coming and going. Seeing will be known, hearing, body, breath will still be known. And there might be more thinking because of the more openness of the attention. But whatever it is that's predominant in any given moment, whatever it is that the attention is knowing, then the practice is simply to acknowledge this is being known. And of course, you don't need to repeat any words in your mind, but you can if you want, if it's helpful. And here the meditation object isn't a particular object of experience, but the present moment itself, that this is being known. And then this is being known. So in this way, you'll notice that the continuity of present moment awareness has a different feel, different quality to it. Because we're right in the middle of this diversity of experiencing different objects being known one after another. but of course, always being known in the present moment. So we'll continue for about five minutes in this way. And if you can, see if you can notice when a hindrance arises, the wanting mind, the aversive mind, the sleepy mind, the restless mind, the doubting mind. It's just the next thing being known, being felt.
And then now before we end, just sensing if you can this independent presence. So the awareness, the mind that knows, the heart that feels, that that's independent of any particular object being known. The space of awareness or the space of the knowing mind. And different objects, different experiences come and are known, then the next thing and then the next thing. But there seems to be some stability, some equanimity, some balance that persists. So notice that persistent balance of the mind. To some degree unflappable, whatever's known, oh yeah, this is being known, now this feels like this. And see if you can sense the peacefulness of that equanimity, of that balance. Peace, peace with the conditions of the moment. Peace with what's coming and going in experience. And if you like that gesture, Anjali, you can do that. And then taking care of your body, adjust your posture. So we are recording the Zoom, but the uh, Gabe Keller Flores, our office manager, he won't have your video showing. Um, so I'll try to remember to repeat any questions that you ask back. So that will be recorded so that people who listen to the class later uh, will get your question by my repeating it. Or if I forget, then Gabe will write it out so people will see that. And I think I've mentioned several times, we learn a lot from having people check in, both in terms of your sit tonight and it might be nice for some of you to check in about what you learned when we were doing the more directed part of the practice, what you learned when we were doing the more open attention, non-directed part of the practice, what was challenging, how did you work with those challenges, what, what felt really right or what felt like learning, you saw something about the nature of the mind or the nature of experience that you hadn't seen before. And we collectively learn by hearing different people check in. So I, I'd encourage you not to be shy. And I think with this size group, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to begin, who would ever like to begin. And if two people unmute themselves at the same time, I'll just try to keep track so that somebody else can go next. Who would like to begin? What have you been learning? What's felt challenging? What questions are emerging in your practice that you'd like to bring up? Thanks for sharing, Shannon. That's really good to hear. And I'd encourage you, this you know, we might think that this one pointedness that we did at the beginning is something really just for meditation times, but actually it lends itself for daily life, like doing one thing at a time. So when you're washing dishes, you can practice, like another word we use in Buddhism is absorption. 
So, or maybe a more useful word is the unification of the mind. So generally the mind, the kind of ordinary mind is quite dissipated where we're sort of the mind, heart is pulled in different directions, likes and dislikes, it's distracted, it's superficial. But when we unify or gather the energies of our heart and mind and do just one thing, like be aware of the breath coming in or be aware of washing dishes, then we're dropping everything else. We're not thinking this, worrying about that, noticing. We're giving the full heart, mind, body to this one thing. And it's, it's a good way. Now, not every activity lends itself to this, but this is more like the depth or the unification as opposed to the breadth of awareness, which is more like what we did at the last third of the sit tonight. Yeah, other thoughts that come to mind. Somebody wrote here in the comments about um, practicing with the eyes open seems to help combat sleepiness and mind wandering. Absolutely. And I'm glad that's, that this person noticed that because sleepiness, as a lot of you know, is a very common hindrance to meditation. And it may be related to not getting enough sleep. But even when you're getting plenty of sleep, sleepiness can be a formidable obstacle to deepening of meditation. So one thing you can do, sit up a little bit straighter, that can help bring some energy in. Another is like this person is suggesting opening the eyes. And this is also true if you're having a lot of dreamlike or where your mind is getting attracted to different mental images that are coming up because your eyes are closed, you can really stabilize the mind by opening the eyes. Because this, you don't, you're not actually looking around, but the visual field is sort of grounding the mind in the present moment. It's less likely, the mind is less likely to be seduced by its constructed mental images. And then it's off. And you know, the mind, just like the thinking mind is just spewing thoughts, it rarely stops. Have you noticed? But the related to the thinking mind creating verbiage, the, there's another aspect of the thinking mind that deals more with mental images. And it just keeps spewing mental images, one after another. A lot of them are ordinary, some are seductively pleasant. Some are maybe horrific, just like our thoughts. But that's what that part of the mind does. It's just generating content, whether it's in the form of mental images or the form of thought. So if you're getting a lot of that flow of mental images and your mind is constantly getting entangled, getting identified with those images, then open your eyes. It can be really helpful. There's nothing about meditation practice that requires the eyes being closed. Although it does help with this uh, one-pointedness where we're using a directed meditation because reducing sense experience helps the mind just keep that one mental or that one meditation object in mind. Just like having a quiet room to practice is helpful. Closing your eyes can be helpful for that style. Yeah, other comments, questions that have come up, things you'd like to share with the group about what you're learning or what's been hard? Do the best we can in terms of choosing the time, choosing the place, how we negotiate with the people in the house or the apartment, and then we let go. And so once we've done our best in terms of you deciding when you're going to sit and, you know, how, all those um, different parameters, but once you've done your best, then after that, everything that happens is a teacher. Like Shannon mentioned indigestion, you know, or heartburn, or it could be a disturbing sound or our neighbors got their Harley Davidson out and making a lot of noise. It could be any number of things show up in our practice a disturbing memory, pain in the knee. But at that point, you know, we've done, like we thought about the, how we're going to sit and all that. 
So then when physical pain arises, then it arises as a teacher. Oh, this is being known. Can this be okay? Like, does my mind, my heart have the capacity to make peace with the sound of the children? Or to make peace with the idea that my partner was supposed to be taking care of this or something like that, right? So, and then we practice like, oh yeah, can this just be something being known? And if the answer is no, like the reaction is really strong, then okay, so the mind is reacting. Can that be okay? So I'm losing it. My mind is losing it and I'm noticing it, and I'm noticing what that feels like in the body, can that be okay? So even if we have to do that a few times, I'm really hating myself, I'm thinking that I'm a real failure at this, well, can that be okay? I never should have taken this class. Okay, doubt, resistance is being known, can that be okay? So that's what happens, like, especially if we're doing the open meditation practice, we're just sort of letting it rip. So that re reactivity is the next object being known. But even if you're doing the one-pointed practice where you're directing the attention back, it's still going to get drawn to those noises and then to the mind's reaction to those noises, right? There's nothing we can do. The mind will notice unless the concentration is really deep. So when the attention goes away, we notice that it's gone away. If we notice we're reacting, we notice that. We make peace and then we come back to the, to the anchor. And there's a lot of value. Like we, it may not be a pleasant experience, but returning over and then the mind going back to thinking about the kids. And then we come back and the mind goes back to thinking about the kids. So even if we're doing that a hundred or a couple hundred times in the course of a 30-minute sit, that attempt to notice what the mind is knowing, to notice the hindrance, to notice the distraction, to make peace with it. Oh yeah, that's what, this is what's happening. Feels like this in the body. Can this be okay? Well, yeah, kind of. Okay, what else? Let's come back to the anchor. That little exercise that we do dozens, hundreds of times is really powerful training. It may initially feel like oh, I'm bad, but no, no, that's actually the retraining of the mind to realize that the kids are making sounds, somebody should do something, and I'm putting down my obligation as a parent right now, right? That's a powerful move to come back and then to get drawn back in to the parental role and then to come back, and the, right? There's a lot of learning what letting go really is. And that's a lot of what we're doing. It's the same thing with memories that might be intruding or thoughts about the future. You've got a big day tomorrow and that keeps showing up during the evening set. And then you realize, oh, obsessing about what's going to happen tomorrow. It feels like this in the body, seductive. I feel the draw to go back into the content, but I'm going to come back and feel the body sitting. I'm going to feel the next breath coming in, the next breath going out. That's the work. Thanks, Sean. Other thoughts, other learnings you'd like to share with the group? Yes. We'll dig in a little bit more next week, but there's real power in being able to name what's active, what's dominating the mind. It's like the old, you know, um, in the dark ages, you know, when they, th you know, about dragons, once you know the name of the dragon, you've got some power. And it's the same thing. Like once you know what's dominating the mind, what's seducing the mind, because in a way to know that there's doubt happening, the wisdom has stepped outside of the vortex of doubt and now sees doubt as just the natural phenomena in the mind, in the heart, in the body. Oh, this is what doubt feels like. This is what doubt looks like. This is what anger looks like. It's really important to be able to step out of those little self-dramas and recognize it 
as just mental, emotional, and bodily activity being known. And we're not dismissing the different emotions or the different reactive patterns. We're actually being, this is how we learn how to be intimate with it. Because that's actually what, like anger as an example, that's what it is. It is that emotional, mental, physical experience being known. What else would it be? And that kind of radical simplicity of, oh yeah, this is being known is very empowering, surprisingly so. So let's take Sally's comment as a cue to really explore that this week. And just in general, and I wanted to make this point earlier before the sit, um, it's usually week three where I encourage us all to just get curious about the attitude of the mind, the mood, the different qualities that are there. So if you can, Really resolve like tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and Tuesday. Just really resolve two, three, four times to ask yourself, what's the mood now? And just to, <clears throat> you know, just a moment during the day and also during your formal sitting time, just to check, well, what's the attitude of the mind like right now? Like, is there frustration or is there lightness and joy? Is there doubt present or is there clarity? Is there contentment or wanting? Is there kindness or aversion? Right? We're just sort of curious, like what's the particular texture, shape, quality of the mind right now? Like even right now, how's your mind right now? What's it like? What's the mood in the mind right now? And it's a particular talent, like we're, because we always feel like we're judging ourselves when we sort of turn the awareness back toward the mind, like, oh no, I better, I better clean up. I'm going to look. So, you know, pick up the underwear and make the bed or something like that. But we want to get used to being interested in the quality of our own heart and mind. It shouldn't make us feel self conscious, it shouldn't feel weird to notice the mood, right? It's always surprising like when your best friend knows your mood and you don't, <laughs> or your partner, right? Like, how can that be? Well, we know other people's mood more than we know our own mood. Other thoughts that come to mind? Sandy, thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, it sounds like what you're describing, because it's, it's always hard for us to put into words the happiness of seclusion. And we often describe it in terms of energetic experience. But the, you know, the question, as much as you can tell, is it pleasant? I mean, certainly it sounded like from how you described it, that that is a pleasant experience. Is that true? Yeah. That's the characteristic, like I said, but it's a different kind of pleasure than eating ice cream or watching a fun movie or even hanging out with friends, right? So yeah. it's a non-worldly pleasantness. And this is the pleasure of seclusion. And the thing is, once we get a little bit of that gathering of the heart and mind, you know, from not from distractedness toward in the direction of non-distractedness, there's a gathering or a unification of the heart and mind. Everyone's going to describe that a little bit differently. But over time with practice, you just learn that territory. And the key is as it starts to feel good, feel right, like a mental healing, heart healing, right? The coming together the heart and mind. I like the word stability. There's an inner stability or grounded quality, like the heart, mind is held, but not in a tight way, but in a really beautiful way. We want to notice and appreciate that pleasantness of that, because that will, that will support the deepening of that stability, of that concentration. Noticing that it feels right, wholesome, and good 
supports the deepening of concentration. If we don't, if we're not mindful of it, then the, then the nice quality will cause the mind to sort of do rifts on the pleasure. So we actually, success in unifying the mind can lead the mind into more distraction because it doesn't know what to do with the good feeling. So it starts to think and plan and imagine because it's got all this nice feeling, this nice energy. So by noticing it, then it feeds, it's like part of the gathering of the mind is noticing. It's almost like now we're not just being aware of the in-breath and the out-breath, but we're noticing the joy, the calm, the joy, the ease of being unified with just the meditation object. And like you said, Sandy, it can also happen with open awareness practice because it's really about the continuity of present moment awareness. It isn't about the specific object. It's about the continuity of present moment awareness or the absence of distractedness. That's what leads to that, that wholesome unification of the mind and heart. Nice to hear. And that's inspiring for the rest of us. Time for at least one more person. What else have you been learning? What challenges have been coming up? And remember next week in particular, it'd be good to bring some of the so-called obstacles. Like what is it that's getting in the way for you in daily life and in your formal sitting time, what's getting in the way of the continuity of mindfulness? But any uh, last sharings or comments, questions? I'd like to. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Well, it's totally okay to use some of the guided meditations, but it is a bit of a crutch. And we do want to learn to be independent of the crutch of using somebody else's instructions, but it's definitely something to take advantage of maybe, but if you're doing it, I wouldn't do it every day of the week. And remember that the important thing is every day, every week that we're learning something and learning doesn't necessarily mean we're having a pleasant set, pleasant meditation time. It might, feel really distracted, but there might have been a lot of learning, even though the mind in a sense was all over the place, but we were developing good habits of acknowledging what was moving in the body, what's moving in the heart, learning that the terrain of the hindrances and being able to identify, oh yeah, there's greed in the mind, there's aversion in the mind. Yeah, and then, um, Yeah, just that, that confidence, like taking a little time at the beginning of a sit, especially when you're not using a guided sit, and just give yourself a refresher for two to three, four minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've set aside this 30 minutes. What am I doing? And mm -hmm. your recitation to yourself won't be perfect, but it's a way of getting more and more independent in the practice to be able to give yourself instruction. And here, this, gives a, this is a beautiful segue for the last two minutes. Um, I'll give you another little set of instructions. Because remember the first week I said just two qualities, alertness and relaxation. And we were using that like if we got distracted, okay, all I have to do is be alert or clearly aware and relaxed. Clearly aware of what's being known and relax, allowing it. But now I'm going to make it slightly more complicated. And I'll send this to you in an email um, so you can look for it. I'll do it right after the class tonight. This simple acronym of RAIN, R-A-I-N. It's quite common. Tara Brock, many other teachers use this, have been using it for years. And there's slightly ways you hear about it. So the R in RAIN means to recognize what's being known. Right? So recognize what's being known. And then the A is accept and allow. It's like relax. So recognize what's being known. Allow it to be what it is. I is to be interested, intimate. And the N 
you can't really do the end, but you can notice it when it's happening. When you're doing the first three really well, you're recognizing what's being known, you're allowing it. There's real interest, real intimacy. Then you'll notice the mind lets go. That's the non-attachment. That's the end and rain. So recognize, allow, interest, and the realizing moments of non-attachment. Non-attachment has the flavor of freedom. That's the like a nice definition of Nibbana or Nirvana, awakening, is realizing a moment of non-grasping, non-attachment. So the mind, the heart is intimate, right in the moment, engaged, but there's no friction of attachment, no struggling. The mind isn't in conflict with what's coming and going. Engaged, but not tight. Well, really nice to be with everybody tonight. Appreciate the, the great comments and questions that came up. And then next week, uh, Tuesday, we'll be digging in a little bit more about obstacles and the five hindrances. So see what you can learn this week. Bring your comments next week so we can learn from each other. Wish you all a good week. Hope to see you down the road. Take care now.